Okay, so welcome to Vilnius Jewish Public Library. <coughs> We're going to talk in English today. There were very many people calling us and asking why there is no translation, and the explanation was the only one that it would take a longer time for us to do that. Maybe next time we'll have that discussion in another format. I'm so pleased and happy to welcome to congratulate and thank you for being with us the ambassador of the state of Israel to Lithuania, Mr. Amir Maimon. And someone who might be called the godfather of, of this library. <clears throat> he was at the very beginning uh, of the idea and he gave a lot of support and a lot of cooperation to have this library happen, to be it established. And now, as you know, we, this is the president to be, maybe, <laughs> uh, and a member of the EU Parliament. That's a social And so let's get started, because the topic seems to be interesting. And you know, Ambassador, the generation of mine. Uh, grew up with the, we, were, we used to be taught, as we called it, geographic astronomy. Because we used to hear about countries outside the USSR which were as unreachable for us as stars. You know? The distance between Sweden and New Zealand was the same, unreachable. And to, see, to say about Israel, it seemed even more unreachable and not real very much, because uh, Jerusalem and places like Galilea and nothing, they are in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, something related to mythology. And we were not quite sure that it really exists, <laughs> well, at least that, that slight impression. So, but on the other hand, the Soviet propaganda was constantly uh, giving us news about continuously ongoing peace talks. And uh, very few people could understand the, the parties of the talks and the size of the talks and what uh, the ground of the matter is. <coughs> so now the situation has changed uh, substantially and almost we've got a lot of more of knowledge and are aware of Israel. Many of us travel to Israel. We found out that it's real. Mm, but when I was looking for speakers, for other speakers to, to have a larger panel here, I found out that very few of leading journalists and, and analysts are actually following what's going on in Israel. And many of them refuse to talk saying that well, you know, I'm in the media, I'm in the current events, I'm not following it, uh, not updating myself uh, on a daily basis, so I don't feel competent. And actually, we lack that information, I think, so that in media, it still it is very much on, on it. Unfortunately, one of the famous and leading <coughs> speakers and analytics uh, Vladimir Slotsky fell in with, with the flu, which is rampant here in Ukraine. But we have other excellent speakers here, like Indra Makarikita. Uh, she could be joining us, like an old friend of mine, Ramona Zvogdanas. And many, many other faces, I think that they will be able to ask things and, and maybe to comment. So, but the first word is yours as keynote speaker. Thank you. <coughs> Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for uh, joining us once again uh, in the Jewish Library. Uh, this is not my first uh, time to be here, and I'm very thankful for Juvenas for uh, all your good work and initiatives, and for inviting us today to speak. It somehow feels that uh, this event, uh, even before started, uh, reached its peak. And uh, I'm very happy about it. And uh, as uh, it was uh, uh, published, this is an open discussion. And I will be more than happy to uh, hear your questions and to have uh, a real exchange about at least the way I see the uh, developments uh, in uh, my part, uh, in my country. 
And I would like to promise you a few things. The first one is that I'm not going to try to convince you that we are right and the other party is wrong. I'm not going to convince you that the other party is right and we are wrong. The second thing, oh, oh. the second thing, I'm not going to uh, tell you that the conflict is not complicated. But what I will be talking about uh, today is mainly about my personal experience and my personal feelings and thoughts about the conflict as I experienced it since uh, 1958. And I was born uh, before the uh, Six Day War and unfortunately I personally participated in some of the uh, military conflicts in uh, our region as a soldier and officer. And I would like to start with uh, uh, sharing with you feelings and thoughts. In 1982, I was uh, a second in command in uh, an Israeli battalion. And uh, for uh, several years following the uh, Black September uh, 1970, when the uh, PLO, <coughs> the Palestinian Liberation Organization, headed by uh, Chairman Arafat, had to flee Jordan, they uh, found a place in Lebanon. They settled in Lebanon. And from Lebanon, they launched uh, terror attacks, uh, quite a number of them. In 1978, the famous uh, attack on uh, a bus, which was uh, taking Israeli civilians from the northern part. Over 30 Israeli citizens were murdered. As a result, we launched the Litani operation. And then there were several years that uh, we uh, really uh, face uh, uh, a wave of uh, terror attacks which mainly were generated from uh, the Lebanon territory. And that's why it was uh, decided in 1982, June, to launch the uh, Lebanon uh, war, which, uh, as I said before, I took part in. Now, I'm not going to give you a history lesson, and that's why I didn't start in 1948, in 1947, the uh, United Nations Resolution. In 19 1982, the main objective of the war was to uproot the uh, Palestinians, the, the PLO bases and terrorists from Lebanon soil to distance it from Israel territory. And I remember as a second in command in the battalion, after the first day I became the battalion commander as my battalion commander was killed, along with many other good soldiers and officers. And I remember how frustrated I was when I saw uh, Arafat and his people fleeing Beirut on French, French vessels, and that was part of the ceasefire agreement that was reached. I was frustrated because, you know, for many years we were trained, and I was training uh, my soldiers to consider the PLO as our en enemy, because they were our enemy. And then year passed, and in 1989 I decided to join the Israeli uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I uh, changed the uniform from military uniform to the uniforms that I'm wearing today, the suit with the tie. I was posted in, I was posted in Ethiopia. And then in 1992, I found myself in, uh, in London. And uh, in 1993, to much of my surprise, I learned in September of 1993 that we are going to sign a peace accord with the Palestinians. That the Israelis and the Palestinians Liberation Organization representative met secretly in Oslo, reached a deal, and we are going to have peace. And I, I didn't believe it. I was confused. Because as I said, for many years, for me, the PLO, they were the enemy. But then I listened very carefully to what our late Prime Minister Rabin said. He said, you don't make peace with friends, you make peace with enemies. And I remember the euphoria and how happy we were when we watched on TV the ceremony in the White uh, House lawn where Prime Minister Rabin, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs at that time, Shimon Peres, and the uh, Palestinian uh, Liberation Organization Chair, Mr. Arafat, his Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, Abu Mazen, were sitting behind the table and signing an agreement. <coughs> now, before the agreement, 
Sharon Arafat, and that was part of the uh, <coughs> tradition, uh, there was an exchange of letters between Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister uh, Rabin and Chairman Arafat. This is Chairman Arafat's letter to Rabin, and in his letter he wrote the following, and I will not read everything. The first one he wrote, the PLO recognizes the right of the State of Israel to exist in peace and security. And then the third paragraph. The PLO commits itself to the Middle East peace process and to a peaceful resolution of the conflict between the two sides and declares that all outstanding issues relating to permanent status will be resolved through negotiations. The PLO considers that the signing of the Declaration of Principle constitutes a historic event inaugurating a new epoch of peaceful coexistence, free from violence and all other acts which endanger peace and stability. Accordingly, the PLO renounces the use of terrorism and other acts of violence and will assume responsibility over all PLO elements and personnel in order to assure their compliance, prevent violence and discipline violators. And I'm reading it to you because for us, the Israelis, we really believe that peace will prevail, that that's the end of the conflict. And we were all very optimistic. I remember that I was addressing different groups because that was the, uh, the most uh, <coughs> uh, interesting topic that people were looking to have discussion on. So I was invited to, along with a Palestinian representative, and we were addressing different groups. And I was kind of sharing with them, well, my personal uh, wish that my children, and I didn't mention, I was brought up uh, in a family where my father was uh, an army soldier, an army officer. I didn't know my father, because when I was born, he was in the, uh, in the uh, army, serving, defending our country. We were surrounded with uh, uh, neighbors that uh, had different ideas about uh, uh, Israel. And uh, I didn't know him. And when finally he retired, it was my turn to join the army. And I joined the uh, combat units, and I was rarely at home. So I was sharing my wish that my children, that I didn't have at that time, will not have to experience what I had to, what my father had to, and it would be possible to live in a, a different environment, really in peace and security for all. So we were all very happy. And uh, the Israelis met the Palestinians, and uh, there were some tough negotiation in Cairo, but they led to a second agreement, the Cairo Agreement. But then, in 1994, in October, and I remember it like it was yesterday, we, uh, I, uh, we had our Prime Minister in uh, uh, Rabin, late Rabin in uh, London, and uh, a series of terror attacks, a very uh, uh, terrible uh, terror attack, suicide bombers in public bus in Tel Aviv and elsewhere, uh, started the uh, process of taking the two parties apart. And basically, what I am trying to say, and that's, what I, that's my main message uh, today, is that uh, we can get into the details. And some people will, uh, may ask, but we know that the Israeli settlements are the main obstacle. Uh, just uh, for the record, when the Israelis uh, met and signed the Declaration of Principle, the one in, uh, that was signed on September 13, it was also agreed that all outstanding issues, including the question of the Palestinian refugees, the question of the Israeli settlements, the question of borders, the question of security arrangements, the question of uh, relationship with other countries will be discussed during the permanent negotiation, that this negotiation on the permanent status of the uh, uh, relation and the territories. Unfortunately, we didn't get to this stage. <coughs> we didn't get to the stage that we can sit together and talk about 
the permanent agreement. Now, you may, uh, uh, and as I promised, I'm not going to put the blame on the Palestinians, I'm not going to put the, the blame on the Israelis, but we didn't get to this point that we can sit down. There were a number of attempts, one of them was in 2000, in uh, Cape David, when uh, uh, former Prime Minister Barak met uh, the uh, Palestinian uh, uh, chairman, Mr. Arafat, during the uh, meeting under the hospice of uh, a former American president, Mr. Bill Clinton, uh, a comprehensive deal was put on the table. There are many, uh, th there were many uh, interpretation to uh, what kind of deal was uh, put on the table, but uh, it really <coughs> doesn't matter at this stage whether uh, the Palestinians were offered 95% of the territories that were occupied and the remaining 5% uh, by swapping land, uh, though a, 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 an arrangement on Jerusalem, refugees were presented, but in the end of the day this deal was not uh, adopted. Was not adopted, was not accepted, and instead in 2005, another wave of terrorism, in one month during the month of March, over 100 Israelis were murdered, butcher in Atania, in hotels, once again suicide bombers. What I, may, what I will try to answer today during the discussion is uh, my personal uh, uh, view that, uh, as I said, there are many, many uh, complicated uh, issues that need to be resolved. My personal belief is that uh, once the two parties will reach the stage, that they will understand that there is no other solution but, but, the negoti but, sitting, around, but sitting in a room trying to resolve the differences, that's the only way. Many countries are coming up and uh, offering solutions to the conflict. And uh, this is uh, uh, maybe <coughs> a natural uh, political move by, other, by, by the international community. The international community is doing uh, its utmost in order to bring this uh, conflict to an end. But in the end of the day, and no matter what uh, the American proposal will be, what the European Union or the Quartet will be putting on the table, in the end of the day, it will be for the two parties to agree about the future of their relationship. It's only for the Palestinians and the Israelis to reach an agreement. Any agreement that would be imposed by a third party will not survive. Any agreement that will bring one party to be very happy and other party to be very disappointed will not last for many days. Just an agreement where, to put both, where both parties will be either happy or disappointed may have may has the chance to uh, uh, survive. I'm personally very optimistic. I'm optimistic by nature and I believe that uh, hopefully sooner than later it will be possible to bring this uh, conflict to an end. What uh, I believe that uh, when I'm talking, when I Thinking about the role of the international community, how can the international community can bring the two parties to accelerate the uh, negotiation? I think about people-to-people uh, -people projects. Because what happened is that in 1993, when we signed the Declaration, when the Declaration of Principle was signed, in general, the Israelis and the Palestinians were very close. It's not that there was a huge gap in animosity and hatred between the two parties. Yeah, there were. There was some sort of uh, coexistence. Uh, many Palestinians were working in Israel. There were, I can say, normal relationship. Normal, uh, if you take into consideration that uh, one party, and this is something that uh, we cannot deny, it, uh, are under occupation. And even if it is the most uh, modern occupation, in the end of the day, it's occupation. So we cannot deny it. But people live together. And we were traveling all over. Israelis were traveling to Gaza Strip, were traveling to the West Bank, and Palestinians vice versa. And uh, unfortunately today, the two parties are, there is a huge gap between the two parties. And even if tomorrow, 
an agreement will be signed, it will take, uh, wow, well, a generation or two to bring the two parties together. And at the end of the day, we are destined to share this territory. There is no other way that one day we can uh, you know, fall asleep and uh, wake up in the following morning, morning and we'll find out that the Palestinians decided to leave to Latin America or vice versa. The Palestinians will go to sleep, wake up in the morning and find out that the Israelis decided to move to Lithuania. <laughs> it won't happen. We are destined to share this very little thin uh, uh, piece of land, which is just to give you an idea, one third of Lithuania territory. We're talking about Lithuania 64,000 square kilometer and uh, Israel is about 22,000 square kilometer. And we need to find a way to share it, to learn how to live in peace, security, mutual respect, and to follow the principles that were set uh, very clearly in the uh, Chairman Arafat uh, letter. So when I think about the international community, I think that there are many things that can be done. Because uh, on both parties, we can do better when it comes to educating <coughs> our children and the young generation to live in peace. And to understand that the other party is not the enemy. That the other party is not the reason for the uh, difficulties that we are facing on a daily life. And in order to reach this stage, we need to invest more in bringing people together, Israelis and Palestinians. And how can we do it? We can organize, for example, summer camps, bring children together. There are here and there some projects, bringing teachers together, little Israeli teachers, uh, Palestinian <coughs> teachers, professors, doctors, you name it. Now, there are, under the surface, uh, ongoing uh, uh, cooperation between uh, uh, Israel and the Palestinians. I just uh, visited uh, Israel, I came back from Israel. Uh, many uh, Palestinian patients are uh, treated in Israel. You'll be surprised to learn that uh, Israeli volunteers are waiting for the uh, patients in the border uh, uh, crosses, taking the Palestinian patients to a uh, clinics, a uh, hospital in Israel, bringing them back it all going on. But we need more of this. We need to bring our people to understand that there is no other way but peace. And peace is, and democracy is not just about election. Look what happened in the Gaza Strip. Today, when we're talking about the future relationship between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, uh, it's not that uh, there is only one Palestinian ent entity. There is also the... Uh, uh, Hamas in the Gaza Strip, and the Hamas is not uh, in a, a very good term with the Palestinian Authority. So there are many things that the international community can do, and my personal opinion is that uh, the agenda should be positive, not negative, because when you put the pressure on one party, and in the end of the day, uh, it's also it's not just about the politician; it's also about the people, the people that elect the politician, and. Unfortunately, as a result of the uh, uh, really very uh, uh, tragic events in our territories, in both parties, people have uh, distrust in the, uh, in the possibility that we'll reach one day that uh, we'll be able to live in peace and harmony on both parties. We don't believe, the Israelis do not believe that uh, the Palestinians are willing to recognize Israel's right to exist willing to renounce terrorism. And the Palestinians on their side do not believe that the Israelis are really uh, uh, willing to live in peace, willing to withdraw from territory, willing to uproot from Israeli settlements. Now, somehow it becomes that the Israeli settlements policy become the main issue. As I said before, it was agreed when the Declaration of Principle was signed that everything would be on the table. So my point, and I usually speak about it, if the Palestinians think that we are bluffing and we have no intention to uproot Israeli settlement, call the bluff. Call the bluff. Let's meet in the negotiation room. Let's start talking about it. I can tell you that myself, as a young captain of the Israeli army, I participated in the evacuation of quite a number of Israeli settlements, including the largest settlement in the Sinai Peninsula, 
after the peace accord was signed with uh, Egypt, in 2006, Israel withdrew unilaterally from the Gaza Strip, uprooting quite a number of settlements. <coughs> so, what I'm saying is that let's talk about it. Negotiation should uh, be for, free from <coughs> any precondition. You can enter the negotiation, ne negotiation room with a clear understanding what will be the outcome of the negotiation. It's a give and take. There are so many important issues on the agenda and it requires that both parties will sacrifice. Both parties need to sacrifice because if each party or, or both parties will stick to their gun, will stick to their positions, we will not reach an agreement. And only by making some painful compromises it will be possible to reach an agreement. An agreement that will bring the people to live together in peace, <coughs> harmony, and uh, hopefully security. As I said before, I'm personally, and I will end here, I'm very uh, optimistic about the future. I think that uh, we really don't have any other alternative. Uh, there is no military solution to the conflict no any other solution. It's uh, the only solution that I see is that the two parties sit together, reach an agreement, and uh, making sure that the disagreement will last for many, many years. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And uh, since I know that our guest, Mr. Patras Oshev, just soon has to leave, probably to meet his electors. So let's, let's use him as long as he is here with us. And my suggestion would be to speak about something that's uh, how it's reflected in the wider world. Uh, once I was in, in Haifa University meeting a psychology professor, and he was showing around the university and also a parking lot, and he was saying that they used to, uh, to hide in that parking lot. It was a hiding place when the rockets were launched from the hill, from the side of the Lebanon. And I saw he was really excited and he was moved. And, and he said, uh, you know, everything starts here. And I thought he wanted to, to deliver, to say actually that many problems, many things just <coughs> Fruit out from the tension which is which is still probably going on until the peace talks have really started very in a very good uh, good way. Uh, so how is it in Europe and maybe wider world? Uh, what are the attitudes, how it is seen, how it's evaluated and if it if if the ambassador uh, if you do you agree with the ambassador that only those two sides, two parties, have to find their solutions, and nobody from the outside world cannot propose any plan for that? Thank you, Julius, first of all, by inviting me to this uh, exchange of views and debate and uh, um, debate and discussion with the uh, larger public. I do support uh, the activities of the Vilnius Jewish Library very much, by heart. I think we do need uh, such uh, very precious uh, cultural uh, institutions uh, in Vilnius, Lithuania, in Europe, not just to please ourselves. As we did a good job, we have uh, nice premises uh, furnished and uh, uh, with excellent selection of books, but it's because of the better understanding of each other. You know, the 20th century, it's over, right? It wasn't a time period for peaceful solution in the Middle East, unfortunately. It was a time period for will expressed, let's make a peace, all right? It was a time period for a chance and uh, attempts, continuous attempts, I mean, to enforce this peace, but it didn't happen. We have a chance for 21st century, finally, to reach an agreement and a peaceful uh, 
coexistence and a situation in, uh, in the Middle <coughs> East. Amir is completely right. The territory of uh, the state of Israel is very tiny. And if you take uh, per square kilometer or meter, density of events, history, cultural events, military events, social, economic, and it's marvelous history behind. I mean, density is huge, right? To what extent this history reflects present and uh, probably future? I do hopeful that uh, military conflict uh, time period should come to the end. What kind of a peaceful solution uh, for this piece of land, uh, which simply crying for a uh, peaceful solution, will come? Look, from the point of view of Europe, if you look at the map of uh, our part of, uh, of the world, Israel, Middle East, it's our neighborhood. It's not somewhere. I mean, uh, the flight uh, time from Vilnius to Tel Aviv doesn't exceed three hours. Three and a half hours. Three and a half, all right. It depends on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make a compromise. I'm sure, I mean, the planes will be bigger, uh, the speed will be high, and, and more people uh, will, uh, um, will fly to uh, one direction and, and, and back. Uh, uh, from both uh, capitals uh, to meet, to exchange, and, and really to establish a uh, uh, relation, uh, relationship. So, from the European uh, Union point of view, uh, Middle East is European neighborhood. There is a very strong interest, strategic interest, to see stable, all right, developing, prosperous, okay, based on peace, Middle East region. Europe tries I mean, to facilitate, mediate, assist the peace process, I'm very proud for this, we're not a part of conflict, we try to build up on peace as much as we can. Are we successful? Not necessarily all the time. There is always a step forward, sometimes back, sometimes two forward, one back. But um, if you see the history of, uh, well, at least uh, uh, recent history of uh, Middle East uh, peace process, I think to a great extent uh, we, the members of the European Union, might be proud uh, seeing uh, many attempts to reach out something what we want to see for uh, as a lasting solution in the Middle East. Just to remind you, the Nice Declaration from 1980s, 80 in fact, uh, to be precise, recognized the right, uh, the right to security and existence of all states in the region, including Israel, and the need to fulfill the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people. It's at most important principle. We can't build uh, peace for one state, one people, at cost of others. It doesn't work in the Middle East. Probably it doesn't work uh, uh, all over, but uh, to remember this principle and to push forward uh, with this principle uh, uh, ahead uh, when it comes to two-state solution, it's, it's indeed important. Let's raise a, uh, a question. I mean, do we see the overall, let's say, global, regional interest to see this co peaceful co coexistence in the, in the Middle East? I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say so. Let's be frank. Iran, its policy line towards Israel is completely hostile. Up to now, the highest leadership of uh, Iran uh, declares uh, destruction of Israel as uh, ultimate goal of uh, state of uh, I Iran, which is wrong. Do we believe that uh, Iranian uh, uh, interference in the Middle East is in favor of peace process? Not at all. Supporting uh, radical uh, 
groups, uh, those groups who uh, are in uh, military uh, uh, conflict with uh, the state of Israel, I think it's, it's a really a bad uh, sign of, uh, of this process. Then, Berlin Declaration of 1990 uh, included the explicit commitment of the creation of the Palestinian state and recognition of the Palestinian state when uh, appropriate. Important. I mean, we have to agree and implement this principle of two states solution. Both peoples, they legitimately uh, demand stable, solid, lasting solution. Um, well, if you look at present uh, state of play, Amir mentioned this completely rightly, the Palestinian administration is not in control of, of Gaza. Uh, they can't uh, control uh, military groups uh, operating in, in, that, <coughs> in, in, in that strip. Uh, well, should we ask uh, about the uh, state of, uh, of Palestine as such? I mean, uh, uh, how can you call uh, yourself a state if you don't control a big part of your state? It's, it's a big uh, uh, issue which uh, needs to be resolved, of course. We should assist the uh, uh, Palestinian side with uh, state building, with confidence building, with institution building, and not just by words, and not just by words. Um, to illustrate uh, the EU engagement in this regard, not necessarily absolutely efficiently, but every year, every year, on the annual basis, the European uh, Union's support, financial support for Palestinian side is around 1 billion euros. Huge money, huge money. Lot, lots goes to, uh, uh, for humanitarian operations, but sometimes I, I, I question, and I, do, I think I do it uh, rightly so. Uh, does every euro go into the right direction? Uh, tunnels, weapons acquired by those military uh, groups. I think there is a certain, uh, probably even a black side of this economy, which uh, sometimes works against the peace process uh, in, the, in the Middle East. And uh, finally, to be mentioned, is civil, uh, uh, civil uh, declaration uh, on, uh, of June 2002, uh, just uh, 15 years ago, which introduced very specific uh, uh, criteria for the so-called final solution uh, of the establishing uh, uh, the or strengthening the Palestinian state and going towards two states solution as such. The roadmap for peace was attached. I mean, how much it is fulfilled, it's another issue. It's probably a debate for many, many hours. But, well, what I would probably describe as a policy line from the European Union in general towards Middle East and for Israel and Palestine uh, conflict uh, prevention and uh, uh, peacemaking. I would call it probably uh, engagement, all right? commitment. We want to see our neighborhood being stable, our neighbors cooperating rather than fighting each other. Um, how much uh, we are advancing towards uh, this, uh, this goal, uh, it depends. It depends, because we are not just single player in, uh, in the area. As I mentioned, take for example Iran's policy line, uh, instability because of Syrian war, all right? We know who is in, in Syria and uh, uh, what side uh, uh, do they take. I don't believe that uh, uh, President Assad is, um, in fact, uh, a big supporter of the peaceful solution uh, um, between
between uh, Israel and, uh, and Palestine, not at all. But uh, nevertheless, um, sometimes probably we are overambitious. Once we see the history of 20th century, all right? It's time consuming, okay? It's time consuming process. Let's be realistic. Let's not relax and uh, let's not enjoy, I mean, just uh, uh, empty uh, or uh, no result producing uh, negotiations uh, uh, process and so on and so forth. But through confidence building, through positive engagement, through probably precise reaction and naming things as they are, if it is a terrorist attack, it should be called a terrorist attack. Otherwise, I mean, people will be confused and there uh, will be no right uh, decisions taken as a response. But nevertheless, uh, we are hopeful that uh, not taking sides, it's very dangerous by the way, in the European Parliament uh, um, there is a division, it depends which uh, side of the uh, plenary goal you are uh, observing or you are placed in, there are very much pro-Palestinian uh, oriented people, more probably on, on the left side. They are very radical. Uh, they <coughs> demand as uh, solution should come as of today. Full boycott for Israel goods, no cooperation, uh, close to breaking down uh, diplomatic relations and so on and so forth. I don't believe this is a road uh, towards peace. Uh, there are people who are reasonably probably critical uh, towards both sides and uh, again, rightly so, but again, those people I would uh, call, they are willing to see uh, actions uh, which are um, indeed uh, might lead towards a uh, stable solution. Um, you know, um, Simon Bolivar once said, uh, from Latin America, I mean, a, a great uh, national hero of, uh, of many countries in, in, uh, on that continent. He said that, uh, you know, to, uh, to imprison or probably to, uh, to make uh, people uh, being slaves, it's easy. But to enslave people, to make them free, it takes time. I mean, it's, it's not an automatic process. I mean, uh, you know, it's something else. So that's why this mentality of conflict, mentality of tensions and non-confidence, it's very deeply rooted. It's not just uh, a, a military situation, it's a mindset. It's a, it's a certain mindset which uh, should be ch uh, changed through many, many things. And in most uh, cases, I would say probably soft power is an important element in this regard. So that's why when I see reports from uh, that region that uh, in, in the uh, primary schools of uh, Gaza Strip, in handbooks, still there is a kind of philosophy of hate, a call for destruction of, uh, uh, of neighbor, as Israel is, I think it's, it's a wrong element in the confidence building. If, uh, if the next generation will be taught in this kind of the, uh, philosophy, what should we expect in the future? There is no peaceful future if the young generation is, uh, is getting ready I mean, to fight uh, their neighbors and uh, not to cooperate, not to be in partnership, but to be in a kind of non-confidence uh, mood and a uh, uh, military uh, kind of uh, resistance. So that's why we should be hopeful and completely right uh, uh, with Ambassador. Uh, but again, we shouldn't be naive and we should invest and look how much our assistance and to what extent uh, those confidence building and peace uh, enforcing uh, uh, measures are um, going to the point in order to change situation in general. Not just being, uh, you know, a pair sending checks 
and thinking uh, uh, at the same time that uh, money will change the situation. Sometimes things go in opposite direction. Thank you. Thank you, Tatra, so much. So, as everybody knows, uh, this event was announced as an open discussion, and I want it to be interesting, fruitful, and that means also that it's very well coordinated and everybody keeping rules, speaking one at a time and limited time <laughs> questions rather than uh, many, many thoughts, because uh, we have to use uh, our, our guests, I, I suppose. So, I would like to open the discussion. Mm, or maybe, uh, on the other hand, maybe there are those. Like, you, would you like to say? Nobody else? Uh, so, yeah, the floor is open. Who is the first? Yeah, please. Uh, this is both to, to you, to ambassadors, and to uh, your parliamentarian. Uh, as a Jewish European, and also a Jewish American, I am, and also a Jewish Lithuanian, and also Israeli, three passports, luckily. Um, and I, so we have a debate in, the, in, okay. in this country. Uh, Which passports do you value the most? <laughs> uh, they're all valuable to me. Good. All, uh, all three countries uh, made me what I am. Now, uh, now, what uh, I would like to, to support are near uh, Jewish people, even when they've been in the concentration camps and ghettos, always have hope, and we have hope, and I also have hope for eventually we need peace. Well, the mayor, at some point, I think, maybe I mean, will correct me, said that the Arabs will love their children more than they hate the Jews, then the eventually will be maybe peace. But now, to you, uh, to your, your, your. When I go to Israel very often in Latin America, and also here, and I'm in, in among Jewish people, uh, and myself personally, I look at, uh, behavior of the European Union really not as a fair game, uh, fair player. And first of all, uh, to me personally and many people, labels on Israeli status to me is basically reminds me of the 30s in Germany. Where the 30s in Germany, mm -hmm. where shops that we can don't buy from Jews, this is to us the same thing. Uh, number one. Number two is those businesses in the, the West Bank <coughs> uh, really provide jobs to Arabs, to Palestinians. And the U.S. saying what uh, there is this Hamas government, who is really a terrorist government, but even, you know, the government in the Abbas government is also holding on. Who knows if they have elections, who is going to take over this, uh, this supposedly free language, who is going to come to power? So, in um, the meantime, uh, many uh, Palestinians do get jobs in those companies, and when we buy uh, Israeli wine and some other products, they really uh, not, and not only benefit Israelis, they also get a quite decent, uh, decent uh, salaries, which they really cannot get uh, in even some other many uh, countries, in supposedly independent countries. Now, uh, that's one thing. The other thing is, uh, uh, settlement. Settlement is all negotiable, like Amir said. It's uh, <coughs> not when you're talking about two, uh, two countries for two people. Yeah? Don't you think that the, the uh, Palestinian mandate, Jordan was part of, of, of British, is, is correct, Amir? The Jordan territory was part of, of the Palestine area. And I think that uh, the Palestinians already got a country, Jordan. Well, that's it. This is also historically the land uh, of our Jewish people, and also, and talking about uh, double game with Iran, uh, I think Europe is more interested in making money than making peace. Mm -hmm. uh, we are doing every path, especially now trying to create a system where we, which will go around the SWIFT system, which is completely uh, will see the reaction of, of America to this. But this is just, I think, the money. But on one hand, they're talking against the ballistic rocket development. On the other hand, they're still continuing trying to go around the table and under the table to sell. I think money is more important uh, since the Europeans. And, and I think most, the only reason why they're interested in peace is to make money and so there will be no refugees coming to the European Union. 
the European Union doesn't really want those refugees. This would show us uh, all the elections. So what is your opinion on this? Is how, how correct is, is my view? I think, it's, I think Europeans more, love more money than the real peace. You made it a uh, very comprehensive and quite long uh, observation. Sorry. No, it's, uh, uh, I mean, to describe the situation in the Middle East, uh, it takes time. <laughs> no, believe me. And, uh, I think on the Nobel Prize winners, I mean, might describe in one sentence uh, if they if they can uh, at all. But uh, you know, if you ask me, I think the two-state solution uh, was proposed not just by the European Union; it's a UN-based uh, kind of compromise uh, solution uh, already for quite a period of time. I wouldn't go back and uh, try to reverse uh, all those principles. Of course, I mean it's up to two especially I mean, to agree and to see the final settlement. But <coughs> I would be sticking into those uh, principles which have been uh, uh, agreed on, uh, on UN uh, uh, level and now the quartet uh, under the US, uh, Russia, UN and EU is trying to implement this mandate in, in reality. I agree with you. Europeans like money. And I give you an example, Nord Stream, a gas pipeline under the Baltic Sea uh, connecting uh, Russia and, uh, and, and Germany is, is a golden example of this uh, thirsty for money principle and uh, let's do uh, business and don't see a larger geopolitical situation and even the climate change uh, policy line uh, I think it's uh, it goes against a bit uh, uh, the European commitments to be environment friendly and uh, climate uh, protecting uh, uh, um, implementation policy line. Um, on uh, excuse me for interrupting you. I think everybody loves money, <laughs> <laughs> but there is also moral issues. Which, which which is completely right. I mean, uh, and everybody needs money. Uh, sure. Probably again, but uh, money. Uh, I mean, money making process shouldn't go against uh, very basic principles. Uh, if it goes against, so the whole system is in danger and uh, might collapse uh, not reaching even a, a, a third of uh, amount of money you, you, you will make. Uh, you know, I'm against uh, boycott uh, of uh, Israeli goods and uh, this call, uh, for me, it's absolutely too radical. I, I wouldn't go, uh, uh, we reject uh, uh, all the provisions uh, uh, in, in many European papers and believe me, well, since the European Parliament is made of uh, different uh, 28 countries' representatives, so many uh, different political groups, uh, even regional uh, uh, representations, to agree on a final uh, text of any statements we, uh, we make, it's so time-consuming, and sometimes we, in a, such a uh, fight uh, in closed groups, agree on, even on some, my, you would say, minor things. It's a constant fight, and fight for long, long hours, and so on. And again, we agree on text, but uh, once people leave the room, I mean, they leave their, their own opinions. And if, they, uh, uh, if you ask them at the, at the doorstep, just they left the room, they will proclaim again. Bloody principles of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, boycott and so on and so forth. So, I'm against, I'm completely right, that uh, providing jobs for uh, in Palestinian territories, it's a great thing. People change. I mean, they become more stable and uh, uh, more reliable partners. It's more than even jobs. It's also what uh, Amir was saying. It's inter interrelation between people. As well Which as. Eventually, will have to live together. As well as. But, uh, all right. I mean, uh, seeing all that, uh, um, my point is, I mean, employing radical uh, statements, calls, and principles, it's not a solution for the Middle East. I think uh, uh, we should agree that uh, uh, we, we need patience, we need time, we need commitment, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, fewer outside powers uh, trying to interfere, seeing very uh, narrow interests, mainly about uh, uh, military presence, uh, 
uh, some uh, re uh, religious groups uh, to be supported uh, and so on and so forth. So, and the longer we, we keep probably this uh, conflict uh, being open and uh, fire on, I think the, the more we attract attention from outside, more, you know, in spite of globalization, uh, uh, I don't see a lack of uh, bad will in the world. So recently we have witnessed the signs of warming up or normalization of the bilateral relations of Israel with certain countries in the region, such as Saudi Arabia or Oman. So do you think next step uh, for a normalization uh, could follow in the near future? And is it possible without solving the Palestinian issue first? Thank you. Well, you're, I think that your observation is uh, very right. I don't have much to add. And uh, it's hard to tell. We would like very much uh, to see uh, Israel relationship with uh, every country in the world uh, normalized. We would like to uh, be able to shake hands with representatives of countries with which, with which we don't have diplomatic relationship. We would like our... Uh, uh, Power Olympic, Power Olympic uh, teams be able to uh, participate in uh, competitions in Malaysia and not to be boycotted and uh, we would like our national anthem to be played when our sportsmen and women are winning the first place and not to uh, uh, compromise for the uh, Karate Association uh, national anthem whatsoever. I think that uh, many of the uh, our countries in the Gulf, value, recognize, and appreciate what relationship between with Israel can contribute to their own country. When it comes to technology, when it comes to economy, when it comes to many, many other spheres, I'm not that sure that uh, they would be willing to uh, uh, give up the positions on the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, before it would be resolved. One of the arguments that uh, the Israelis are making is that uh, they should uh, think the other way around. That if relationship with the Arab world would be normalized, it can contribute a lot to the peaceful resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But at the moment, uh, uh, it's still, we are still not there. Uh, just uh, last week, the uh, Arab League uh, ministers met with the uh, uh, European Union Foreign Affairs, there was uh, a heated discussion about, uh, as uh, uh, presidential candidate Petros mentioned, about the uh, statement. Uh, they didn't reach an agreement because there were some differences about uh, uh, the language. But what concerned me about the European Union statements, and I completely agree with uh, Mr. Kaplanas, the uh, if you will measure, you know, Let's leave aside the fact that I'm in Israel for a moment. And really, I'm trying to be as objective as possible. I know that uh, in the end of the day, I'm representing the state of Israel. And for some of you, uh, my views uh, are far from uh, being close to your views. But if you just measure the words, the number of words, let's count the number of words that the foreign affairs uh, ministers dedicate to the Middle East peace process in every one of the FAC, which is the acronym of Foreign Affairs Council, in comparison to other crises in the world, Syria. Let's agree that Syria, a place where tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are butchered on a daily basis, use of gas against civilians, very short power. Iran. And uh, it was just mentioned about, uh, you know, when uh, European ministers are traveling to the Gulf countries, they usually come back with a uh, uh, big surprise. Why big surprise? Because they don't hear from their Gulf uh, states' uh, counterparts complain about Israel, but about Iran. But yet, when it comes to the language, Maja. <laughs> and uh, so this is really uh, frustrating. Now, the point is, okay, 
we understand that we are no more the underdog. Israel is no more the underdog. We used to be the underdog until 1967. Since, since 1967, we are not the underdog. But what the European Union failed to understand is the impact of their position on the public opinion in Israel. Israel is a democracy. You may like this democracy, you may not like the democracy. Uh, for me, it's a too democratic country. We have uh, in a house of 120, uh, uh, in the parliament of 120 seats, there are representatives of over 10 different political parties. We are heading to elections and the number of parties are growing. growing. And I'm saying it because in recent years, the majority of the Israelis are opposing any compromise, territorial compromise, and they are against it. So, you know, I'm, I'm willing, uh, and this is now I'm speaking as Amir, not as an official representative, I'm willing really for uh, some painful compromises in return for a real peace. But I'm today in the minority. To whom to compromise? To whom? Doesn't matter. No, no, it's, it's, it's really doesn't matter at the moment to whom. Assumingly that uh, the two parties will sit together and hopefully will uh, start a real negotiation about the permanent status, we will have to find a way to overcome or to bridge the gap. And there is a gap. Okay, there is a gap on the Israeli settlements, on the question of Jerusalem, for example. Prime Minister Barak, in 2000, said he had the formula. And the formula about Jerusalem was the Jerusalem boundaries are wide enough to contain two capitals as long as they will recognize each other and be recognized by international community. Now, I'm not getting into the details. <coughs> And by the way, I just came back from Eastern Jerusalem, and it was so refreshing to walk uh, uh, <coughs> along the, uh, the, the market and to watch okay. the small shops of uh, all the uh, Arab merchants selling yamukas, you know, the Jewish kippah, mm -hmm. with the Davidos uh, uh, You wouldn't believe it, they were even selling t-shirts of IDF, Israeli Defense Forces. I'm not talking about Israelis, I'm talking about Arabs, Hanukkiah and others, and uh, I'm not trying to suggest that they become Jews, but I think that when it comes to business, and business is very important, this is uh, for me a proof that, yeah, we can make it, we can live together, and we need to live together. The uh, uh, last thing that I would like to say, everybody has a solution, okay, two-state solution, three-state solution. And what if the two parties, in the end of the day, will come together and will decide about a different solution? It will, be not, it will not be recognized by the international community? If we, the Israelis and the Palestinians, will sit down and will decide to have a very creative solution. So the European Union will oppose? The United States of America will oppose? By the way, the agreement between the first agreement, the Declaration of Principle between Israel and the Palestinians, was reached secretly in Oslo. The Americans, they were surprised to learn about it. <coughs> so I think that uh, it's very important to stick to the principle that it is for the two parties. And I'm going back to what I tried to say before. I do see a role to the European Union. And the role is not a negative role. It's not to impose sanctions on one or others. It's to offer not the sticks, but the carrots. Oh. Tell the, tell the two parties, no, come on, there are so many carrots, come together to find a way to bring them to the, to the table so they will be able to talk about the real issues, the real problems. This is, I think, a very constructive way or a very constructive uh, policy that uh, I believe at least uh, will appeal to the Israelis and to the uh, Palestinians. <laughs> So then you and that towards you. Okay. Actually, it's you. Okay. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, well, uh, may I ask you, Mr. Ambassador, about the 
well, hard to say that, mixed reviews of recent Lithuanian Prime Minister's visit to, uh, to this world, and good and bad as well. Uh, well, how do you comment on some criticism, criticism regarding not visiting the Palestinian authorities of there? Well, there was some political tradition in Lithuania uh, to do that while visiting the as far as I understand, the Prime Minister has a very good and efficient spokesperson, so you should address this question. This question is But I can say that we had a very fruitful visit, very constructive uh, meetings with uh, both the Israeli president, the Lithuanian Jewish, uh, uh, sorry, the, the uh, uh, Litvaks uh, in Israel, and the uh, Prime uh, Minister uh, Estrenalas uh, with his uh, delegation participated in uh, a joint event of the Litvaks in Israel uh, during which uh, they uh, commemorate the International Day of the Holocaust. It was very respectful with the uh, participants of uh, the Japanese uh, diplomat uh, Sugiara San, uh, righteous among the nation, and uh, it was really very impressive. Uh, there was also a business uh, forum and uh, during which uh, we not just sign an agreement on cybersecurity. Uh, it is uh, not uh, a theoretical agreement, but this is uh, an operational agreement, a real cooperation between the CERTs. The CERTs are the operational units of uh, each country dealing with cyber-related issues. And the meetings with, uh, uh, between Prime Minister Netanyahu and uh, Svernales was uh, a very warm follow-up to the very uh, historic visit of Prime Minister Netanyahu here last uh, August. During the meeting, we explored, uh, the focus of the discussion, by the way, was about ways and means to enhance economic relationship. <coughs> Minister Sinkavichus and his Israeli counterpart, Minister Cohen, brought up some really uh, good ideas, and uh, we are now uh, exploring uh, ways and means to realize some of these ideas, maybe to open an Israeli uh, bank here, maybe to increase the number of direct flights between Tel Aviv and uh, Vilnius and uh, Lithuania is willing to subsidize uh, such uh, a line as long as there will be a third destination. So theoretically speaking, they're talking about uh, maybe uh, having flight from Tel Aviv, Vilnius, uh, San Francisco, for example. Mm -hmm. So there are really uh, great ideas to uh, enhance relationship. And I think that uh, for me, uh, as an Israeli, as a diplomat, it was so uh, encouraging to uh, participate in meetings uh, during which the uh, majority of the discussion was focused on how can we do things better. May I do a short follow-up because you mentioned the Israeli Israeli bank maybe coming to Lithuania was just was that just an example uh, uh, set by you, or there were some concrete talks about this matter? Well, a concrete invitation was extended. Now it's uh, for the other party, you know, when you invite someone, uh, you need to uh, look for uh, the visit. So um, it was agreed that uh, we will get in the, that uh, uh, follow-up discussions would be held. And <coughs> it's all about marketing. Uh, in terms of your relation, regulation, the Lithuanian regulations are very comfortable, and uh, uh, it's now uh, uh, depends pretty much on the ability of your uh, side to convince the Israeli banks that it was opening uh, an Israeli bank here in uh, Lithuania. Okay. No, yeah. you and then you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I have to run. Uh... Mr. Petras will answer in writing to questions. Yes, indeed. Yes. So don't hesitate, okay? <laughs> <laughs> right, it's thinking. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for opening speech and a bigger picture gave us. So I would like to uh, ask two questions. My first question is related to current state of affairs uh, in terms of negotiation between Palestine and Israel. If you can share some uh, details or insights, what's going on right now. And the second question is related to a well-advertised proposal or to be proposal by Trump and Kushner. Is it still coming? And maybe you can give us, can you shed some light on the terms of the upcoming proposal? Thank you very much. 
too long questions, too short answer. <laughs> Unfortunately, I cannot uh, uh, share with you uh, an update about the uh, current status of the negotiation between the Israelis and Palestinians because there is no. The two parties are waiting, and you uh, rightly uh, uh, mentioned the, uh, the Trump's uh, peace deal, and uh, we really don't have a clue about the deal. Uh, there are many speculations, there <coughs> are concerns on both parties, and, and uh, we are still uh, waiting until it will be presented. Uh, but definitely it's, going to, it's not going to be presented before uh, the second half of 2009. Israel is heading for election on April the 9th. Usually it takes uh, up to two months to form a government. So I believe uh, only in the second half, probably in the summer of 2019, uh, it will be presented. Thanks. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, thank you very much for the speech. It was really interesting. And uh, as a preemptive strike, you mentioned that such things as uh, settlements are not very important, but the details can be negotiated. So, at, but at the same time, you speak about such things as uh, people-to-people -people projects uh, and going to camps and so on. So I'm just thinking that it's necessary to mention that it's quite difficult to go to a camp, for example, when your house is demolished or you are tear gassed every day. So I think you, you just, uh, just, just to mention that, that it's a little bit, when we talk about possible negotiations where uh, both uh, sides are standing not on the same uh, like, uh, level. But my question would be not, uh, not, not on that. I'm just interested because, um, like you mentioned, that Israel is, uh, is, is a great democracy. A lot of parties will go on to the election. So I'm just interested in what part occupation is uh, playing and if it is playing in the debates and uh, like what are the positions about ending it, about the negotiations with the Palestinians. Thank you, Linda. Uh, yeah, also, yeah, there are houses that are uh, demolished, were demolished, but you failed to mention that uh, from these houses, terrorists uh, uh, went to uh, kill Israelis. So yes. So 1,000 orders of demolished were issued yes. every day, every year. There are thousands of uh, Israeli casualties as a result of terror attacks. And uh, thousands of houses are not demolished on a daily exactly. basis. Exactly, 1,000 houses. Uh, to your question, uh, as I said, new parties were formed. Uh, Mr. Uh, the uh, former uh, commander of the army, Lieutenant General Benny Gantz, uh, formed a new uh, political platform. And uh, at the moment, uh, it's uh, a very popular political platform. And uh, I can tell that in the uh, uh, in every party, and this is. Uh, the, uh, the political, uh, in the uh, manifesto of each one of the political parties, there is a reference to the uh, peace process, there is a reference to our relationship with the uh, uh, Palestinians uh, and the uh, uh, in Mr. Gantz, uh, retired General Gantz party, he just recently made uh, a clear statement about the uh, desire or his intention to bring this conflict to an end. So it's part of the political debate, and uh, but you should know also, and you know better than me as a journalist, that uh, during general elections there is also uh, uh, lots of lots of focus is uh, on uh, social, economic uh, related issues, domestic issues. So uh, that's uh, also uh, true in Israel, but in every party. There is a reference and it's part of the uh, manifesto. In some parties, it's the most important thing, it's the top of the agenda, especially the center left uh, parties. Okay. Please. I also have a question for Mr. Ambassador. There is no other. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someone to come here and see. <laughs> no, but uh, seriously, uh, thank you for holding this event. Uh, it's, uh, very nice to see this happening. And uh, my question would be about uh, the two-sided uh, effects of the walls in Israel. From the one side, uh, I 100% uh, understand the necessities, 
and uh, the demolitions of uh, terrorist houses also are obvious to me. So the safety is a top priority for Israelis, and I I think that's uh, a legitimate legitimate call. But from the other side, you also in your uh, speech uh, uh, you mentioned the alienation and the 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 alienation of the Palestinians who foster among themselves, I would say, that, that the hatred is there. So that they, uh, from on the other side of the walls, they uh, are trapped and alienated. And how do you see, you know, possibly this uh, in the future, this disappear? Because now that uh, both sides, are, as I see, they are coming apart, you know. One is more and more hateful towards ever, and the other is just trying to protect itself. Just uh, um, some uh, some history background of uh, the uh, security world was erected uh, after the defensive shield operation in 2001. After really a uh, bloody, bloody months uh, during the Sharon uh, government, during which uh, people who were celebrating the Seder in Park Hotel in Netanya were butchered. So uh, the Israeli government decided to launch the defensive shield. And uh, uh, they reach a decision that uh, a fence should be erected, a security fence. It's not a political fence in the sense that uh, it's not that uh, we are now marking the future uh, border or it's not our wishful thinking about the future border. Some people believe that uh, this is a political uh, uh, world, but it's not. And just check the statistics since uh, 2001, the uh, rate of terrorism dropped down to uh, very, very uh, uh, small percentage. Yes, you're right. Uh, and in some places, uh, I, I won't deny that uh, some villages were uh, split. And to reach from one uh, side of the village to the other side, it takes uh, an hour, two hours, or sometimes even more. But what do you expect from uh, a government that is facing this ways of terrorism? The first uh, duty of government is to provide its people with uh, uh, security. And that's what uh, we are doing. I wish, you know, I told you, I uh, am old enough to remember different times. I was uh, in the middle of the night, was traveling from my hometown, Rishon Lezion, uh, to Gaza. I'm not joking. I was, I was doing it. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm having falafel. Falafel is the, uh, the, um, uh, the vegetarian uh, kind of bowl, well-known vegetarian, and the best were in uh, Khan Yunis. And I was standing there alone, surrounded by uh, hundreds of uh, Palestinians who were preparing to travel to work in Israel. And you could go to Yeah, but now we are, both parties are responsible for the consequences. So yes, the situation is not... Uh, something that I can uh, you know, uh, cheer for. What I can cheer for is about the future and about uh, at least my feeling that we're wasting time. And we're wasting time because we didn't meet. We are not talking, we are waiting. And there are different reasons why we're waiting. You know, if you ask the Palestinians, we'll tell you one thing. If you ask the Israelis, they will tell you a different thing. But I believe, and once again, I would like to repeat the same thing, that we cannot reach an agreement outside the negotiating room. If the Palestinian thinks that we will be willing to enter the negotiation room with some sort of precondition, it will not happen. And it won't happen both ways. So we will not try to dictate before the negotiation what should be the outcome of the negotiation, what kind of a negotiation it is. And there are still some heavy, heavy issues on the agenda. And each one of them is very loaded. Let's take, for example, the question of the Palestinian refugees. All right? There is a problem. And this problem needs to be resolved. But you know what is the Palestinian uh, position? The Palestinian position is that Palestinian refugees would be allowed to return to their homeland within the territories of Israel, which they don't have, I'm talking about the 1967 borders, which they don't have any dispute at the moment. This is something that we will not be able to live with. 
they, they can, like Jewish people, and there are also Jewish refugees, they should have the right to immigrate to live in the future Palestinian state. But not in, uh, <laughs> in Israel. But this is a very important, crucial point for the Palestinians. I can understand it. But if we will not find a way to overcome it, so we'll be stuck. Jerusalem. You know that one of the disputes is about <coughs> the inner part of Temple Mount, Haram al-Sharif. I said it in both languages, so people will not think that I'm very subjective. The inner part, not the, not the outer, but the inner part, insane. But this is for uh, some groups the most important thing. And for us, of course, it's very important. You know, let's talk about Vilnius. In your constitution, we recognize the historical connection of the Lithuanians to Vilnius. What about the historical connection of the Jewish people? Polish people. To uh, Jerusalem. Polish people. To Jerusalem. Jerusalem was never a capital of any other nation but the Jewish nation. But having said that, I'm... Once again, believe that solution can be found. I believe the solution can be found. I have my own solution, which I will not share with you because. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, yes, I have. And by the way, there, there is a book. You should search for the book. There are 50 and even more ideas how to solve the Jerusalem issue. And by the way, you know, Rabin, the late Rabin, used to say. If there is a will, we'll find a way. So if the two parties really sincere and really look and looking for a, a way to resolve the problem, <coughs> I have no doubt that we can find a way. Because during the negotiation on the interim self-government arrangement, the ISGA, which followed the uh, Declaration of Principle, you can't imagine how creative the two parties were to find solutions to um, uh, disputed issues. And I'm talking about technical solutions. One side mirror. So both parties will be represented in check posts. Both the Israelis as well as the Palestinians. But it will be only seen like the Palestinians are standing there. That's just one example. Solutions were found because the two parties were really uh, determined to find the solution. And today, unfortunately, the two parties do not talk. They do not talk because there is disbelief. Mutual. They don't believe the Israelis, the Israelis do not believe the uh, uh, Palestinians. It brought the Israelis to believe that uh, uh, security is the most important thing. We should uh, uh, enhance security measures to minimize the possibility that Israel will be harmed by uh, Palestinian terrorists, and that's it. Short question. I'll be very short. <laughs> how, how do you reply to the lady who was talking about thousands of, of bombs uh, destroying houses? First of all, I think you should, before accusing of thousands of bombed houses, you should take school books of children in Palestinian territory and compare it to the school books of Israeli children in schools and read the text and honestly give a report on that, okay, on comparison between the two books. That is the future. If the books will be the way we are now, the school books will be no future, number one. Number two, when we talk about democracy, uh, go over to Tel Aviv to, uh, by, by, the, uh, by, the Sabadibi, by the city hall, and you can see how many demonstrations can be against occupation. Let's see how many uh, demonstrations happen on the Palestinian uh, side about making peace with Israel. So it's, uh, that's another comparison. And third of all, take a look at the rights of women, gay men, in Palestinian terrorists, and in general, in the Arab world, and compare it to Israel. Well, when, when you're talking about, uh, uh, and also take a look how many people on the payroll of Palestinian Authority who are getting paid salaries for buying Jewish children. I just want to say that when we talk, I talk about one thing, it's not very, uh, like, you're already talking about the other thing. And no, I, it's all one I've thing. There is no one thing. I haven't it's seen a package. Many, it's a package. many demonstrations, but I do believe it can happen. But uh, no, the questions are, every year 1,000 
Demolition orders are issued. No, it's a lie. No, no, it's no a doubt lie. whatever. No, it's a lie. lie. It's a pure lie. Okay. It's in the line. I think that uh, after the official part is over, you are welcome to stay here for a while and to have some discussions in private. That usually as it goes here. And I would say it's anti-Semitic lies. It's based by report of the Nonsense. Zara, which Nonsense. is Israeli organization. I'm sorry, I want to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to, to give a word for you. It's a lie. To, to, to ten. Uh, uh, Mr. Netanyahu, while listening here in the thing, and he was uh, kind of asking for a different attitude towards Israel from the European Union. What kind of attitude you would uh, think the European Union would have uh, towards problems of the Middle East? I think I was very clear. I think that uh, instead of uh, trying to impose a solution, to uh, put uh, one party under pressure, I believe that the European Union approach should be very constructive. They should be positive. They should uh, come up with uh, carrots, should, should uh, come up with uh, ideas how to uh, bring the two parties uh, together. And I believe that the European Union can uh, uh, be the leading party in initiating people-to-people -people projects. Uh, for example, as I said, the uh, trilateral meeting or bilateral meeting between Israelis and Palestinians under the auspice and the finance of the European Union can be great. Bring, having uh, uh, once a year in every one of the 28 members of the European Union uh, summer camp, which will bring together Israeli children, Palestinian uh, children, and the local uh, uh, country, the Austin country children, to do the same when it comes to uh, 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 teachers, parliamentarians, politicians, uh, and others. I think that uh, this is uh, very important. This is something that uh, is missing. And as I said, okay, theoretically speaking, tomorrow. By the way, today uh, we are not talking, and uh, you may disagree with me, we are not talking about a wedding. We are talking about a divorce. And um, this, is, uh, you're some, this is something that uh, it's very sad, but we should understand it. That <coughs> we are talking today about the divorce. We are talking about the huge gap between the two parties. Do you think that if tomorrow an agreement will be signed, so it will bring the conflict to an end and people will start hugging each other and uh, dancing and... Uh, no. It will take a generation of education and we need to educate our people to live in a different reality with a different set of values to be followed, to respect democracy, to respect the other side opinion. By the way, once again, I'm not suggesting that we are right or wrong, but I'm, what I'm trying to suggest is that at least let's be able to talk to each other, not to look for ways to make the life of the other party more difficult. And we are not talking. And Another thing that uh, we should uh, also remember, there is, and, and this is life, public statements are always harsher than the public discussion. Why it is so? It is so. And you know it better than me. The leaders of both parties are boom, 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 boom. But what you probably don't know, that there is a very good, 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 good security cooperation between the Israelis and the Palestinians in the West Bank. A very good cooperation. And I can tell you even more than that, that if it wouldn't be the security cooperation between the two parties, I'm doubtful if the Palestinian Authority, the Fatah fraction, would exist. Would exist. So, this is a, you know, there is an ongoing cooperation, it's not enough. And it's only focused on security, intelligence. There is also some sort of economic uh, cooperation, which uh, of course can be, uh, in the past, uh, thousands of workers were uh, uh, living every day the Gaza Strip, working in Israel, and today it's not even 600. And still, there are people that are living the Gaza Strip to work in Israel. 600 something like that. From Gaza? Yeah. 
And from a West Bank, how many guys? A bit more, but it's not enough. Two thousand. Official <coughs> part of the discussion. I want to say last word. Last word. Now it's uh, it's Friday evening. Yeah. All right. Shambhala. Friday evening is uh, in uh, Judaism. Uh, the tomorrow starts in the evening before. So even though it's uh, Friday evening, it's uh, like uh, it, for us it's already Shabbat. It's the Saturday. The Jewish people. And before Second World War. Thousands of Jewish people used to live here in uh, Vilnius, everywhere. And you could uh, tell, without even looking at the calendar, that it is Friday because many of the shops and many Jewish people, especially uh, in the uh, winter, because uh, it's uh, relatively dark early, people were leaving their works, closing their shops, heading to their homes because uh, in Judaism you need to prepare for the Shabbat. You need to change clothes, to take a shower. Women usually uh, prepare food. You could smell the uh, very good uh, 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 smells uh, coming out of different uh, houses. And Jewish people were going to synagogues. You know that in Vilnius there were 106 synagogues before Second World War. Out of 106 synagogues, only one remained in Pilimo the choral synagogue, and Jewish people were going uh, uh, in prayer and uh, upon their return having uh, uh, Shabbat dinner, which is uh, a very uh, special uh, uh, meal uh, of uh, probably the most important meal of the week because it's not just about the quality of the food, but it's also about family gathering, uh, sitting around the table and uh, enjoying the Shabbat. And one of the things that you should know about the Shabbat, Jewish people are a bit weird. Why they are weird? Because during Shabbat, they are forbidden to do any type of work. But you're working now. There are 39, <laughs> <laughs> there are, there are 39 different types of works, including to set the fire. Today, for example, you may have an electronic uh, gas yeah, stove. You cannot switch <coughs> Jewish people. Now, in ancient times, it was really a, a, a hard work. People were going to the wood to bring the, uh, the wood, the, 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 the wood. going to the vishka to bring the wood. <laughs> <laughs> and they had to chop it, and they had to set the fire, and uh, it was really a, a big job. So the Shabbat is all about rest. And Jewish people also greet each other, saying Shabbat Shalom, which means uh, Labas Shabbas, which means uh, <laughs> peaceful, peaceful. peaceful Shabbat. So I would like to wish you all a peaceful Shabbat and uh, enjoy the, uh, the weekend. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank you again. And I, I'd like also to, well, to say very, very shortly that uh, it was very important, I think, so to have this, this discussion. We cannot speak very many things in such a short period of time, but it was, it was important to draw our attention to it, to have some focus. And maybe it is uh, some beginning of a wider knowledge and knowing about the Middle East problems, peace process, and there's mm, not interesting, just interesting things to learn, but as a, that Professor Grohaka said, it, it touches upon this, all of us, because many things which are studied today in one part of the world are felt, not necessarily consciously, on all the parts of the world in the same and the <coughs> So thank you again for being with us, thank for all the nice people who were with us and as, as I said, you're welcome to stay for a while here if you have uh, polite discussions in between themselves I would encourage different attitudes and, and, so, and so on so let's have some time together and the official part is over, thank you, thank you